Uh, I think we'll jump into it, and we're gonna we're gonna take these segments. I think uh, you you guys. I think you can see me in the corner there. There I am. Hey, hey, everybody. You can see Cornell West in the in the main thing, and uh, we're just gonna we're just gonna play this out and see where it goes. I think the beginning here. He's uh, he's talking about you know people who somebody who went to jail for being a communist. Now communism needs to be radically called into question. Now that, that's good, right? So he's saying capitalism, communism needs to be radically called into question, and he's saying that because he just said, well, this guy went to jail because he was a communist, and he realizes what he's saying, and he's saying, look, but look, um, communism is a bad thing. Communism is not a good thing. But, but there's a but, of course, with Cornel West. In terms of its dominating forms, like the Soviet Union and China on the Mao they, and so forth. And so are they non-dominant forms of communism? I, I, I never heard of any non-dominant forms of communism. But at the same time, when you look at Karl Marx and his critique of capitalism, he, this is prior to Lenin, prior to Stalin, prior, he says capitalism is tied to this obsession with profit that puts profit before people. Now this is the theme, uh, and you'll see Joe Rogan even catches on to this, this obsession with profit. The assumption, and he makes this assumption just, he, he just makes it naturally, and uh, it, it goes through the entire interview whenever he talks about economic issues, and Joe Rogan just plays right into it, and you see this on the left always, and, and to some extent you see this even on the right with people like Stephen Bannon when they criticize capitalism. It's obsession with profit. Now, what is profit? And, and he assumes that obsession with profit is bad. He assumes that obsession of profit is evil, is negative, and he knows that you all think that because he doesn't have to explain it. All he has to say is obsession with profit means bad stuff, bad stuff. Now, what does it mean to be obsessed with profit? And, of course, the other term he uses, which he uses over and over again, but not just him. This is a common term used on the left, a common term used on the left. Profits before people. Profits before people, right? But what, what are profits, what are profits? Where do profits come from? Now, at least in a free market, right? And, and, and this is a, he's critiquing capitalism. So capitalism as qua free market. Where do profits actually come from? Well, profits come from the production, the creation of goods and services at that are then sold freely, voluntarily, to consumers or to other providers of goods and services, other businesses, at a cost greater than what it costs you to produce. Greater than what it costs you to produce. Now, why, why are people willing to pay you that? Why are we let people willing to pay you more than it costs you to produce. Well, first, they don't know how much it costs you to produce. They're willing to pay you for it. Why? Well, because they are getting more value out of whatever it is that you produced, whatever it is that you made. They're getting more value out of it than you are charging them because otherwise they would not engage in the transaction. And this is kind of, this is Econ 101. This is not hard. This is where intellectuals like Cornel West evade. They're smart enough to get this. This idea of the trader principle, this idea of win-win relationships in economics, in trade, in free markets, are not difficult. Not difficult. So you have a relationship here where a producer produces something, a creator creates something, and he sells it to person B. And the reason person B is willing, is willing to pay for it is because whatever it is that they're buying, whatever service they are getting, it is worth more to them than the money they're giving up. And if it wasn't, they wouldn't engage in the transaction. They wouldn't engage in the transaction. I, you know, I always use my iPhone as an example. If you pay $1,000 for an iPhone, it means that you value the iPhone more than $1,000. Now, you might be right or you might be wrong. You're probably right because Partially, you know, the marketplace has spoken. So many of us, 
value the iPhone is over $1,000, right? That we're willing to pay for it. And it's hard to believe that so many of us are irrational, so many of us just motivated by whim when it comes to a $1,000 expenditure. So profit is a reflection of the value you're creating for whom? For other people. So this idea of profit versus people. Now, we'll get to what he means by it in a minute because, you know, and he never explains it, and the left almost never explains what they actually mean by it. It's, it's a term they throw out and they just assume you all get it. But the fact is you cannot make a profit without making the lives of other people better, without creating value for other people, an objective value. If it is not an objective value, yes, some people might buy it on whim, but it will not last. Any lasting, any lasting profit is a profit generated by producing something that is objectively valuable to the people consuming it. They are better off. Now, it's true. You can come up with examples where th there's a few examples where that might not be true. And I would argue that in a rational, civilized society, you wouldn't be generating profits, not significant profits from them. Think of drugs. Think of the sale of cocaine in a free market. Well, that is not a very profitable business because you're not actually creating value. And the people are better off in some subjective momentary sense, but they're not better off long term. And as a consequence, they're not, they repeat bias for a while, but not for very long. They die or, or they, they, they overcome their addiction. Um, so you can't produce long term profits from selling at this value, an objectively, objective at this value. So profits against people is just absurd. It's, it's a complete misnomer. Obsession with profits means an obsession for creating values that other people benefit from. Now, I'm getting all these uh, super chat questions which I'm having to copy over. So uh, <laughs> that slows me down a little bit. So uh, if the question is unrelated to what we're talking about, I'd really appreciate if you could delay the question until we finish with Cornell West because it, it really does distract me. Um, but I do want your questions uh, uh, in the super chat. Uh, you know, I, I can't read the comments and I'm not going to answer questions that you're not willing to pay, put a dollar amount towards. So... What does Cornel West actually mean when he says profit ahead of people? Well, Cornell is, is fundamentally a Marxist, and he's talking here in the context of Marx, right? He's just said, we have to remember Marx, Marx who came before communism. He, he never mentions, by the way, he never mentions that Marx was the inspiration for Stalin and Lenin and Mao. That is never mentioned. It's just there was, there was these guys who did communism, and, and that's bad because authoritarianism is bad and they were authoritarians and, and bad consequences. Okay, And then there was this Karl Marx guy and he said some really cool stuff and he said some really true stuff. And he came before them and the causal relationship, blank out. No, no, we don't want to talk about that. We don't want to talk about that. So what does he mean? Well, he means, he's talking about Karl Marx's theory of exploitation. So he's really talking about the idea that Marx believes that profit comes on the back of labors, that profit comes from exploiting the people who really make the stuff, really make the stuff. Marx was a materialist, a labor theory of value. The people who really make the stuff are the laborers. Are the, are the people in the assembly line, the people using their muscles to move the levers, to assemble things, to screw stuff, to use their hammers and nails. They're the people who actually make the stuff. And profit is exploitation 
because profit is above and beyond what you pay those laborers. You, the capitalist, gets to keep, but you have contributed nothing to the process. That is the root of exploitation. And that is the root of putting, of the idea of putting profits before people. Because if you put people before profits, then you would pay your workers more. And they would receive any excess. They would receive. Or they at least, as a socialist, they would share in it significantly. And you as the capitalist, or as the manager, as the CEO, would get nothing because you contributed nothing. Or if you're a little bit more sophisticated democratic socialist, you would get a little bit, you would get something, but not much. Because maybe you contributed something, but you didn't contribute much. Now there's a lot I can say about this, and I have done lectures and courses about this, but this is a complete perversion, and of course Ayn Rand talked about this. This is a complete reversal of cause and effect. A complete reversal of cause and effect. There is no such thing as labor without capitalists, without entrepreneurs, without CEOs. There is no such thing as spontaneous production, spontaneous creation by a group of laborers who just build a car, just build a computer. Somebody, some entrepreneur, some genius, some inventor, and then some capitalists have to get together, believe in the idea, willing to invest money in the idea, willing to invest time, resources, and then organize the means of production to make the idea a reality. Bring together labor, equipment, in order to build something, to create something, to make something. Things don't just come into being. But you'll notice, and we'll see this later on with Cornel West, socialists always just assume stuff is there. Wealth is just there. And Cornel West later on will say something to indicate this. And then it's just an issue of how we distribute it, how it's divvied up, how much you grab or how much you get or how much you are allocated. Wealth is not created. And that, of course, is the materialist, materialist view of the world. If all there is is muscle, then all there is is stuff out there, then it's just a matter of rearranging the stuff, and the rearranging of the stuff just happens. It doesn't require thinking. It doesn't require genius. It doesn't require organization. Those are all conceptual activities that they don't recognize us as having any role, any role, in the productive activity, in generally human activity, which is fascinating. Intellectuals who don't value the intellect, but that's what socialists, that's what Marxists are. The intellectuals who don't value the intellect. So they view that everything is just the workers, and the workers would know how to make a computer anyway. You don't need the Steve Jobses of the world. Or if you did, once he had the idea, and you know, big deal having the idea, then the workers would just make it. You know. But really, the real genius in this world is not how to assemble stuff. It's how to, it's how to design it, how to structure, even the means of production, how to structure an assembly line. That's the genius. It's not the work being done on the assembly line. It's Ford who is the genius, not the guys on the assembly line. It's Ford who is producing. The guys on the assembly line are helping along a little bit, each one of them creating a tiny little bit. But it is Ford that is creating the possibility for them to create. And yes, Ford makes a lot more than all of them, maybe more than all of them put together. But that's because he made it all possible, not just by being an engineer in terms of how a car is assembled, but being an engineer in terms of how the assembly line is assembled, in terms of being a marketer, but knowing how to sell the cars. So showing people that the car is a real value to them and creating a car that is a real value to them, not just any other car. And paying his workers an appropriate amount to get them in. You know, Ford, for example, doubled the wages at some point in order to attract the best workers. And every other aspect, every other aspect, of what it means to run a business. That's where the real, the real genius is, and that's where the real production happens. So yes, the capitalists, the CEOs, the, the, the managers deserve what they get. 
in a free market. An obsession with profits is an obsession with creating value, which is an obsession of making the world a better place for human beings to live in. If you value human beings, and I do, I don't want to place anything above human beings. But if you value human beings, then you value, then you value profits. Then profits are what you should value. Profits are a symbol, a sign that human well-being is better, that value is being created. Now, it looks like, I don't know how to change it right now. Maybe I can do that. Uh, right. There was a typo in the, uh, in the uh, title of the show, so I think it's been fixed now. Um, yep, it's been fixed. I don't know if it's been fixed on uh, YouTube, but on, at least on, yep, on YouTube it's the same thing. I don't know how to fix it on the fly on YouTube. On Facebook, it just was changed. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, so that, let, let's go back a little bit, and then we'll listen uh, to a little bit more of, uh, of West. Dominating forms like the Soviet Union and China on the mile and so forth and so on. But at the same time, when you look at Karl Marx and his critique of capitalism, he, this is Look how he lights up when he says Karl Marx. I mean, this guy loves Karl Marx. The, the, the true leftist intellectuals, really, particularly the, the, the not-so-modern ones, the, the ones, the ones who are more interested in the poor than they are interested in skin color, are true admirers of Karl Marx. It truly is sickening. Prior to Lenin, prior to Stalin, prior, he says capitalism is tied to this obsession with profit that puts profit before people mm -hmm. and it will generate oligopolies in which there will be grotesque levels of wealth inequality and the only way that poor and working people will be able to gain access to any resources is through organizing and mobilizing. Now, none of that is true. None of that is accurate depiction of Karl Marx. And none of that, of course, actually happened. He's suggesting it all happened. The idea that capitalism generate oligopolies is, is fundamentally false. It's just never happened. It just doesn't happen. Um, and, uh, and, and it didn't happen in the 19th century as if people, uh, as if people uh, uh, you know, as if people, uh, it, anyway, it didn't happen in the 19th century. You didn't see these monopolistic oligarchs created. Yes, wealth inequality explodes, but so does the, uh, the, the wealth that everybody, uh, the, the poor have. So everybody gets richer, and it's true. The people who create greater value get richer at a far faster rate than the people who don't. But again, he's not going to explain why that's a bad thing. Nobody ever today needs to explain why wealth inequality is a bad thing. They just state it. It just is a bad thing. We just know that it's a bad thing. Marx didn't really talk much about organizing and mobilizing. Oh, I mean, ultimately that happened. It happened organically when capitalism matured and the working class rebelled. But he's suggesting that Marx was an advocate of labor unions. Labor unions are a very primitive form for Marx. Marx is much more about you know, the, 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 the big collective proletarian, you know, uh, uh, and, and the change they will bring about. But this idea, which he says, right, that the poor stay poor. Nothing happens to them without this organization. Even Karl Marx never says that, right? Karl Marx says the poor have gotten richer. There's a middle class. Capitalism is brilliant at bringing people out of poverty. That's not the fundamental Marxist critique of capitalism. But it's what they latch onto, and they use it primarily to, to justify kind of the, the labor movement. And prior to Stalin, prior, he says capitalism is tied to this obsession with profit that puts profit before people mm -hmm. and it will generate oligopolies in which there will be grotesque levels of wealth inequality. 
What is grotesque levels of wealth inequality as compared to ungrotesque levels of wealth inequality? And the only way that poor and working people will be able to gain access to any resources. But that's, again, access to resources. So here, this is important. Access to resources. This is what I meant before by saying they think stuff is just there. Stuff is just out there. Reality is just full of wealth. It's just there. The capitalists grab a big part of that. Their obsession with profits. And the only way poor people can get access to resources, access to this stuff that's not created, it's just there, is by mobilizing. Is by getting together and mobilizing and organizing against or, or to fight because it's all a zero-sum world kind of thing. You know, the capitalists have got all this stuff and, and now... The working class has to organize, has to mobilize through labor unions primarily or through democracy to grab their stuff. No recognition of where wealth comes from, who creates it, how it's allocated in a free market, where it comes from in a free market, none of that. None of that. The organizing and mobilizing. Now you can accept that Marxist insight without being a Marxist. Well, he's just telling the truth. Is, so, it, you, is he telling the truth? Now, watch Joe Rogan. You think that socialism just hasn't been implemented correctly? Is that what you think? Because like the, the, the argument has always been, show me a socialist economy or socialist government that ever worked. Right, right, but right. But there's so many people that find the idea of socialism attractive because it, it combines this idea of a community with a nation and that we're all tied together, and we, ha we obviously have some socialist... Okay, before I go on, because now, now he goes on a... I mean, Joe Rogan's... I mean, he's asking the question it, 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 with what sounds like real sincerity. But notice, he says socialism is attractive, and, and he, he's right. And, and this is the key question that anybody who's advocating against socialism and advocating for capitalism has to come to grips with. Why is socialism so appealing why is it so attractive and and joe rogan says it it's because of this community tied to nation tied to it's because of the appeal of collectivism and deeper than that it's because of the appeal of altruism socialism is attractive because altruism is attractive and altruism is attractive it's because all we know it's what we've been taught it's what we've been raised on there is nothing else Nothing else from a moral perspective other than altruism. We've been taught that it's right to sacrifice, that it's right to focus on those who don't have, that they are the standard of good, the meek shall inherit the earth. And this comes from Christianity. It comes from, it comes from uh, secular philosophy. It comes from everywhere. Altruism is a moral standard, and socialism is consistent with altruism. And this is why... And again, we'll see this come back. We'll come back to this. Christians, Christian cannot defend capitalism. And many libertarians can't defend capitalism because they assume altruism. And altruism is socialism. And Joe Rogan here is identifying it, not, in exp not as explicitly terms as I, I wish he would, but he identifies it, right? He sees it. It gives you this warm, fuzzy feeling. What's that warm, fuzzy feeling? It's that feeling of, oh, caring about your brother, caring about the group, caring about other people, and putting their well-being ahead of yours. Eh, I don't want to think about it too much, but yeah, that feels good. That's what morality really means. Specs to our civilization in terms of, like, yeah. utilities and the taking military. care of the road, See, the military. We're not going, we're not going out. Now, notice the equivocation here. And again, this is kind of equivocation that is childish. And you expect better both from Joe Rogan and from Cornell West. So, the f well, he mentions utilities, but the military, police, these things are socialism. So, and, and this is maybe the damage some of these uh, anarchists have done capitalism, is that people if, as, as associate capitalism with everything is private. There is no government. And that's the danger these so-called anarcho-capitalists have done to us. They have no conception of what government is 
full under capitalism, what capitalism actually is. They have no definition of it. They need never define it. And if you never define something, then it's just capitalism is private stuff. And oh yeah, we don't have private police and private military, so that must mean we're not, you know, those things are socialist. No. Capitalism is 100% consistent. Actually, capitalism requires a government with a police force and a military. Anarcho-capitalism is a contradiction in terms. You cannot have capitalism if you have anarchy. But again, notice how the culture, and Joe Rogan, I think, represents the culture, and I think to a large extent, you know, Cornell West does, certainly more than I do, more than you do, most of you, they represent the culture. They just take this for granted. All the stuff the government provides, that's socialism. And they mix in stuff it should provide, stuff it doesn't provide. It's all this mishmash. That's all socialism. And then it's just a question of which parts of it do we think should be privatized? There's no principle. There's no idea here. And Ayn Rand's idea, of course, that government is instituted for the sole purpose, the sole purpose of protecting individual rights. And then the question is, what, therefore, is, should the government do in the protection of individual rights? What it shouldn't do? There's a standard now. But there's no, when you don't define things like these guys do, or where your definitions are so fuddy, fuzzy, they're kind of meaningless, then what you get is this mishmash of stuff. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brutes.